Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. Welcome to Thursday morning. This is the Network Technologies session. We've got three very interesting talks for you today. The first one is Rishab, who is going to talk about the things above us in the heavens, satellites, and the things we can do with them. Over to you. Hello. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. Today we'll be having a really interesting session that we'll be talking upon. We'll be looking at the. Oh, it looks like. Yeah. So we'll be looking upon new satellite, the, the new world of satellite networking. Now, what is interesting about the satellite networking and why we should look upon it in the current scenario? Let's first talk about that before getting into the session. Now we have our terrestrial network going on all well. We have our ocean cable, we have our terrestrial network fine going, then why we should look upon this technology as of now. The only reason or the first reason that we should think about is that the, the terrestrial network cover, don't cover all the region. And as per the ITU reports, we still have around one thirty or one third of our population that has to be connected. These are all the unconnected people or unconnected areas that have to connect. This note and also as well, we have our terrestrial network, but we don't have any redundancy over them. As, and these satellite links or these satellite options can be our thing. So before jumping into the agenda, we'll understand why we should look at it and what uh, what are the new things that are going to be in, into this and how we can integrate this with the 5G technologies. Our agenda is going to be as follows. We'll be first looking at the basics of the what are the orbits, what are the footprints, and what are the satellite fundamentals. And then we'll be looking upon what is special about the low Earth at orbit satellite technology that is, uh, that is coming up. And then what are the various segments and what are the various services into this. We'll be looking upon the traditional networks. We'll be talking about the inter-satellite links and how they work in the new satellite market. We'll be talking about the integration of the satellite network with the 5G network infrastructure as we know of. Then at the end, we'll be looking at the best practices and we'll be looking upon the key takeaways. Let's right get into it. Thank you for being here. So uh, first of all, we'll be looking upon the orbit. So what are the orbits? So orbits are the are the path that the satellite is taking when, when, when they are launched. It is basically the path the satellite follows when it is launched into the space. Now this path, it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a defined path which is based upon the altitude on which the particular satellite is launched. Now the altitude defines the type of the satellite. When we talk about the LEO orbit, which is the low Earth orbit, we talk, we're talking about a range of around 200 to 3000 kilometers on the altitude from the Earth. Similarly, when we're talking about the MEO satellite, we're talking about the navigation and the data aspect and the range of, this, uh, of these uh, launch areas or launch altitudes are around 3,000 and onwards towards uh, up until 20,000. And following the wind, we have high Earth orbit, which are used for navigation purpose, and then we have geo satellites. Now, the orbit times of these satellites depend upon the altitude on which they're flying. When we are talking about LEO satellites, the orbit time is around two two hours or plus minus. So the thing about the satellite is to cover the entire Earth, we would, we would need a lot of satellites into this, on, into this orbit to make sure that we are having full coverage. And to have this, we would need to understand that what are the footprints. So footprints are basically the view of the satellite that, that the, the view of the Earth it is having from up outer space, the satellite view. So that will be defined as the footprint. And the bands are the one which are the frequencies at which they're talking with the satellites. Now these are in the in the LEO space, these are basically the KU and the K band, which works around in the 12 to 18 gigahertz and 27 to 40 gigahertz range. Now based on these footprints, the, 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 the duration of the orbit is defined. Basically, if you have the altitude higher, which means it will be having more view of the Earth. It will be lower, we'll be having low, low, lower view and we'll need more satellites to cover the same amount of area. Now let's look upon why we should look upon this LEO and what are the special things about this LEO satellites. First of all, they have po lower power requirement. Now reason for this is the primary reason or one of the reason is that these satellites are into the shadow because we have so many of them, we, we would need so many of them that they the most of the time these satellites they'll be uh, on the shadow side of the earth and because of they are in the shadow side of the earth, they would not need their thermal equipment or thermal uh, cooling systems to work and then in that way they save power. The other thing is that they need low, they need to radiate low power because they are on the lower distance. 
from the earth. So they need to talk to the ground station or the user station which are relatively lower to the earth. Now when we talk about the latency, this again talks to us or we can think about it in the in the altitude manner. When we talk about, as we, as we know, when we looked at the this, when we talk about the distance, like the, the latency for these um, low earth orbit satellites are somewhere around typical to the 40 milliseconds. And then as we move, to the, towards the distance, we will get typical latency around 700, which means it increases based on the on the distance at which they are flying. So that is why one of the reasons that these particular low low latency we get the low latency in in this uh, area. Now, why? What is the you know, important thing about the satellite antennas? Now, these antennas are very small. The, the, the antennas that we need to talk to these these particular satellites are barely a size of slightly greater than a pizza box. So that is something really interesting. Now, by the, from the end, from where the military used to use, they used to have these big big antennas, and now it has gone to the end user with very small or you know the size of as we discussed the pizza box sizes of antennas. The next thing about because these uh, satellites are using the KU and the KA bands, which are at a pretty high, high frequencies, we are getting better and data rates in, in these scenarios for these particular low or Earth orbit satellites. And now the, there is no mechanical steering in the antennas, which means these antennas are talking to the satellite using, low, using the um, Phased array antenna technology, which is not nothing. So the, the, the satellite, the satellite is in the space, and we have our antenna. The antenna is not talking to the satellite using mechanical steering. Rather, it is using something known as phased array technology, where the, it is electronically steering the signal, and these signals can be connected to multiple satellites at a single time. So, because of all these uh, reasons, uh, we have our uh, low Earth orbit satellite as a special use case that we can look upon. Now let's look upon how this works. So basically there are three components to be looked upon. We have our user station, which is nearer to the user where we are using these services. And then we have our control segment. We have our space segment. And then we have on the ground segment, we have ground station on the receiving end. Now how these services work are, and suppose a request is made from the from the user end, it first goes to the satellite link. It first goes to the user station. From there, it goes to the satellite links the satellite basically reflects it back or uses laser into satellite links to transfer that request to the other satellite and then it lands to the nearest ground station. And from there it goes to the core network and what happens after this, we'll be looking into the coming slides. Now the thing to understand about this is these three segments take care of the entire infrastructure. When we talk about the control segment, the control segment takes care of the telemetry and the network management of these satellite networks. When we talk about the space segment, as we discussed, these laser inter satellite links take care of, of, of this communication between the, and also if you want to deorbit or anything, like once the service is over for these satellite links and we want to deorbit it, in these also cases, the control segment is the one who takes care of this. And because these satellites have a, a limited lifespan that, that they can service for, and then they have to be replaced with the new satellites. Now we have three types of services that they use. It could be mobile satellite service, it could be fixed satellite service, or it could be used for broadcasting. Now what happens in the current scenario in the ground segment? Let's look at. Let's have a look at it. Now we have our we have our request. Let's see, we have our uh, request coming from the user station. It goes to our satellite network, and then the satellite, nothing being but just reflecting the signal, reflects it back to the ground station. And now from the ground station, it goes to the core where we have our power points using which it connects to a terrestrial network. The request might be for the cloud services. It could be for cloud internet. It could be for some partner SP. Now in this case, the, when, when there is no use of inter-satellite links, it is basically the signal is landing to the nearest gateway out there. It is not moving. Now it is not uh, being uh, uh, transmitted over the satellite link or inter-satellite link. And, but when we talk about the inter-satellite links, we get the best benefit out of it is the reduced latency. Now, why? Because the space, the, our spe uh, speed of light in our space is faster, which means we get on the fiber, we get around two-third of the speed, but we get kind of line rate speed on the on the laser inter-satellite, and which translate to reduced latency. The second thing is that when we have inter-satellite links with us, basically our source and our destination, the, the destination is decided based on where the request is supposed to go. This ground station, in the current scenario are located as per the optimum location where, where it can be used. But these 
this ground station can be closer to the where the request is supposed to be. It, it depends upon the use case that we're talking about. And with this implementation, we could have improved performance in our system. We could have defined landing stations as we talked about. And then we also get some kind of physical security, some form of physical security into this. Now, what are the use cases as we know of them in today's? So the, new, the use case for the satellite networks are first of all, we are looking upon the internet as we know of it. Now the request goes, it goes via the inter-satellite links, it launched to the ground station, to the power points, and then to the inter internet connectivity. Now the very other important aspect or the very uh, interesting aspect of this is that we can use this infrastructure to get back up to our, infra uh, in to our terrestrial network. We can get uh, back up to our terrestrial network. That is one of the use cases and it is a really important one. We can have cloud services directly connected. We can have our computers directly connected with these satellite infrastructures. We can have connectivity to the, to the aircrafts. Now we do have this connectivity, but it is very limited given the cost for the for the for these satellites to be given to the users, so it is very limited connectivity. Very few airlines support this. At least it's not there from where I come from. But yeah, the this is something that is now coming to the picture, or we can look upon it, given that fact that the cost has came down, and we look upon it that how the cost has gone down through the satellite infrastructure. Now, we, if we want to have site-to-site -site connectivity, right? We want to have two enterprise locations, be it remote, be it some offshore mining sites or something which needs, which are not covered under the terrestrial networks, we can have site-to-site -site connectivity using, using these satellite links. Now, let's look upon the integration of these technologies, these satellite technologies with the 5G infrastructure as we know of currently. We have our traditional 5G infrastructure where we have our good old, good old user equipment talking to our our uh, local cell. We'll be having our front all network, we are G node B 5G base station as we know of it, and then we have our core network. Now I've I've marked down three links over here, like the link A, B, and C, from where we can have the, these satellite links as an options. Now what are the limitations of the current satellite uh, or current 5G infrastructure? First of them is that it is heavily depending upon the digital network. Secondly, there is no redundancy. Also, there are a lot of areas that are need to be covered under, under this technology, uh, uh, which are not covered with 5G. So that is one of the use case. Now, 3GPP release 17 talks about one of the very, uh, very interesting implementation that we'll be looking upon, in which they'll be talking about the split of the G node B. Now, when we want to integrate this, technology with the SATCOM integrated 5G infrastructure. When we use the user equipment to directly connect to the satellite and the satellite is talking to the local cell, this kind of connectivity is known as the transparent satellite technology. Then we have our connectivity where we can get the connectivity between the G node B and the 5G core. These, these links can also be used, the satellite links can also be used over here and it need not be a direct link, it could be a redundant link or it could be a backup, backup link to the terrestrial infrastructure. Now what is the benefits and the use case by, for using it as a backup link, okay? So if, if there is some disaster or something and we need a connectivity, 5G connectivity, we can have it using and we can restore our 5G infrastructure in case of some emergency or some earthquake, some natural calamity. Now areas are not covered, the areas which are not covered under the terrestrial network, these, these particular links can be used to have it interest, uh, to have the connectivity for these remote areas. All the 5G services that we know of, that is enhanced mobile broadband, ultra reliable low latency communication and massive machine type communication, all the three services can be implemented using these technologies. And when we talk about enhanced mobile broadband, that is nothing but getting high speed internet or high speed connectivity to our users. When we talk about ultra reliable low latency communication as it speaks about the low latency that we need to have. When we need to have ma massive machine type communication is to have all the devices, IOTs and everything to be connected. All the three services can be supported using this technology. Now when we talk about the 5G and TN implementation, which is suggested by 3GPP, the 3GPP talks about the split of the base of the base 5G base station that is our G node B into DU and CU where the DU can be shifted up onto the satellite so that the DU take care of the lower layers of our network stack and the upper layers are taken care by the CU. Now the benefit of that or is that our user equipment is will never know that such of the implementation has been um, 
has been implemented because our UE2 core video sessions will be intact and they will, they, will, they won't be having any impact on onto the onto this link. Uh, there will be no impact using if we use these links. Now, uh, some of the other use cases for using these technologies could be having emergency relief. We, we, we can have emergency relief. We can have remote area coverage. We, uh, there, so there are two types of emergencies. It could be some personal individual into some issues or into some, um, um, what we can say, into some emergency, or it could be a, a broadcast emergency that's needed to be some earthquake event or something like that. In both of the cases, using direct connectivity to the satellites for the user equipments, we can have, we can have wide area public safety. Now, when we talk about the best practices that the satellite providers can do to make sure that they give continuous services to the users when we talk about resiliency and redundancy. Now, when we talk about resiliency, we can have multi-orbital handshake between these. So basically what they talk about is that these satellite networks, these satellite providers, they have their own orbits and they are currently uh, being implementing their solution individually, but they can have a handshake between them then they can have higher level of secure, higher level of services for all the users out there. Then you can have the use of multiple frequency bands, that is nothing but our diversity techniques. The, the benefit from this is that they can use, they can utilize the spectrum better, but there is a catch to it. The catch is that a lot of these frequencies are being, in some countries, being used by some military or some other organizations. So we have to, they have to make sure that these, these frequencies are being used in a, in a, in a, in a managed way. Now, when we talk about redundancy, now we have a set inter-satellite links. It need and uh, it need not follow the shortest path. It can take the suboptimal part paths to make sure that they're sending the request because most of the time the request will be coming in from the terrestrial areas, and we have we would be having a lot of satellites will be uh, in the in the in the sea side of the Earth and they, they would be doing pretty much nothing during that time. So all the traffic, these traffic can be routed via those links over those satellites which are, which are currently not processing much data. Now these satellite, uh, satellites which are launched always have some redundant components onto them in, in case of failovers. So these redundant components can also be used for making sure that we have better level of services for the users. Now, when we talk about the enterprise con connecting side to side connectivity of enterprise, we can have our net, we can have all our IP network principles to be implemented into this. It could be our QoS, it could be our access list, it could be our IPv6 connectivity that we can easily integrate into this when we're talking about the side to side connectivity. Now, to get better services from the from the from these satellite providers, these satellite providers can make sure that they have stringent provisions into their control segment as we talked about to make sure that they have a better services for the users. Now when we talk about a CSP solution, that the service provider solution, the service providers can use these satellite links for as a redundant networks or, or, or a load balancing technique to make sure that they have failover protection over to their links. And these again opens up to the <clears throat> new opportunities that could come for the CSPs. Now let us look upon some of the key takeaways of the session. Now as we discussed about the redundancy over the terrestrial links, we can get redundancy and this can help us to load balance our network first of all. Second, we can have, have our traffic being, um, uh, our, our connections being connected to the people who are, not, who are not connected or the people who are not covered under the terrestrial networks. Now the second important thing about this is our launched cost has gone down, which means, and this is a really important factor and I would like to focus more on this particular point. Reason being is some of the satellite providers are using relaunchable, la uh, relaunchable like launch vehicles to make sure that they are, their cost of launching these satellites are low. Now how they are doing it is basically they are, they are, they are separating the launch the, the launch booster and reusing it back and which is again making sure that we are having uh, reduced cost into this but this again uh, give us some of the concerns that we have is the it, it, it could give us the dense constellations and as we talked about that these these satellites are to be deorbited after a particular period of time depending upon the uh, the service provider they are implementing these bring us to the to the point where we can have dense constellation and we can have space debris. So the, the, these mon there should be some monitoring which makes sure that these issues should not occur. 
Now the global satellite constellation capacity is increasing by every day, which means we will be looking at more data every day. We'll be, we were having uh, reports of it as of now. There is a lot of connectivity going on and we have a lot of data that is up to TBPS data that we're looking at that is being used, be, being used over the satellite networks. Now, this, because of the reduced, reduced latencies and because of these uh, frequencies that they use, the satellite bandwidth, the cost of the satellite bandwidth, and because of these reuse, reusable launch vehicles, the, satellite, the cost of the satellite bandwidth has came down and significantly came down so that now that you see these technologies in the user, onto the user end and uh, pretty much if you are living into some particular areas or some particular countries, you can pretty much buy it yourself and you can use it. This is the level of cost that has gone down because of these implementation. There are some questions on the cost that, that these, use, these can be used, but it depends upon the region where you, are, when, where you are living upon. So as we discussed that about the various use cases, these LEO constellation can be used into various technologies and various use cases as we know of. Enterprise connectivity is something that we have talked about. We have talked about the cloud connectivity, which is one of the interesting use cases. We have talked about support in disaster, which is really important when we are talking about because the point of connectivity is to make sure that we everyone is connected and everyone is safe. Unless we are able to product, provide uh, safety to our people of the world, then that is one of the use cases that is very important to think about. Then we have our integration with the 5G and the 6G that 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 is there. So to 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 summarize my point, I would say that. We, this technology is new. This technology is become is becoming relatively cheaper. There are a new there are new use cases coming up for it, and because of the high bandwidth, we have a lot of application that we can look upon. So definitely, this is a new technology, and we can look upon it, and we can have our research, and we have our connectivity going on through these networks. And with this, I would like to conclude my session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for this session? Yes. Yeah. Go up to the microphone and remember to state your name and what you are representing. Hi, I'm Nihit. I'm from Netflix. Okay. So since you mentioned about the launch cost has reduced, uh, is there any data what percentage, by what percentage it has reduced? Uh, you can find it. Uh... Uh, on the internet, actually, it 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 depends upon the 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 implementation. The 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 so the satellite service provider who is launching this. It could it it will be depending upon the various uh, satellite providers out there. So the data would be more important from coming from their end. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Dhruv, uh, Rishabh, great presentation. Thank you. One quick question, especially related to how 5G and satellite networks are interconnecting. So what kind of business relationship, uh, how tight should that business relationship be between the 5G network and the satellite network provider needs to be for this architecture to work? Because in some cases where you were saying, let's put DU up there, are we actually saying that we need to merge the networks or is it just I'm buying links from them and to 5G network, they are just links. You can just buy them on the fly. How dynamic this is going to be? Could you shed some more light so, on that? So for, for these implementations to work, right, we have to have a very stringent connections between the, the 5G providers and the satellite providers so that these low, as we talked about, the lower sat, lower uh, network stack, these ne network stack can be shifted onto that. Now we have our virtual RAN technologies. We can do that uh, through that as well. So we need to have a, a, a as as when compared to now, we need to have a better better handshakes between between the sat, between the five G providers and the satellite providers. So, so I, I would agree on with so you on this point. This is point. right now very theoretical. What we are yeah, this is a three G P P implementation that they have proposed. Okay, uh, let's talk offline. Yeah, you can have yeah. Uh, any questions from the internet on this session? No. Okay, I don't see the internet. All right, okay. thanks very much for your insights. All right. Our next speaker in this session is Tim. We are going from satellites to digital twins. I wanted to call this the science fiction or brave new world session. They wouldn't let me. Would you like to talk? Ah, yes, thank you. 
All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Tim. I'm a regional product line manager for IP automation technologies at Nokia, and I look after the APAC region. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about building a digital twin. We are continually building more and more complex networks to meet the highly connected uh, digital needs of our customers and subscribers. With this complexity, you obviously add risk when you change these complex systems. When you do system upgrades or migrations or uh, connect your network with another through a merge, there is a risk that you upset the connected system and cause you know, unexpected behavior, uh, outages and, and that sort of thing. How do you then mitigate these risks? Well, you build operational processes and you test them so that you know exactly what happens when you make a change to the complex system. The downside of these risks with you know, an increase in complexity is that these become harder to manage. They become uh, harder to mitigate, more time consuming and more expensive. Building these processes to mitigate these risks can be a time consuming and expensive exercise. But given you know, the right tooling, you can build uh, processes that you know will allow you to successfully change and evolve your network to deal with this complexity. So you build a lab. This is probably the easiest way to start building and testing your processes to make sure that changes to your network are successful. Uh, say you're building a network with 10 sites. You order equipment for 11 so that you have an extra site to test upgrades and changes and, and protocol moves. But what if you're testing WAN policy or you're migrating an entire technology stack, say from MPLS to SRV6? Well, then one site isn't quite gonna cut it. And you either break down your lab to replicate two sites, sort of, but it, it's not exactly the same as having a match for production. What if you and your colleague wanted to work on two different changes at the same time? Well, you could timeshare the lab and swap configuration and repatch the, topo the topology, but realistically, that's a, a waste of time. There are much better ways of doing things. It's just not efficient. So keeping these issues in mind, let's paint the dream. We want every network engineer to have a one-to-one -one copy of the production network to test their changes and to avoid any unexpected behaviors. Anytime anyone needs to test a change, they should be able to access a replica of the network that uses the same device types, form factors, VLANs, IDs, route distinguishers, IPs, everything. But the challenges we spoke about before, you know, cost, lack of agility, et cetera, make this difficult. If you've not guessed by now, then the solution is you know, fairly obvious. You build a virtual lab that can be used by multiple users and avoids the need to have physical equipment. So what if any engineer could immediately generate a near identical subset of the production network as a twin uh, for their own individual testing? We're gonna call this a digital twin. The digital twin should use the same network operating system of the same version as the production network. It should use the same IP addresses and it should be able to use the same tooling as the production network, be it your monitoring, configuration management or provisioning software. So that's what we're gonna to build today. We're gonna to start on the left-hand side with Netbox. Netbox is a source of truth, open source source of truth application that allows you to document your devices, racks, links, IP addresses, uh, and everything about your network. We're gonna use another piece of soft, open source software called NetReplica, or NRX for short, uh, to query Netbox and generate a topology file. That topology file will pass into Container Lab, and with a little bit of Python for configuration management, we'll build a one-to-one -one replica of the network documented in Netbox. Um, who here has used Netbox in the past, or at least knows of it? Okay, smattering of hands, that's pretty good. Who's used Container Lab before? Okay, not, not too bad, not too bad. Um, I highly recommend you check out Container Lab. It is a Nokia-backed open source project. It allows you to create virtual instances of network devices from varying various vendors, obviously Nokia, but others as well, and it will build the topology for you. 
It's faster and more agile than fat virtual machines as it containerizes everything and builds all the links between all your devices. We'll see that in the demo. So for this, we're going to need an example network. What I've built here is a fairly straightforward data center network. We have an SROS DC gateway layer at the top, some SR Linux super spines, and then we have two pods with spine and leaf nodes. It doesn't really matter how many leaves are in these, it could be you know, really, really wide, depending on how you wanted to build your fabric. Each of the pods run IBGP within them and they have a private AS, and then we have uh, OSPF as the uh, IGP across the whole data center. We have documented this network in Netbox. So this is our list of devices, the super spines are off the bottom, uh, but you can see we have uh, a rack they're assigned to, the manufacturer, the device type, the platform, and their primary IP address. Some of the devices also have a tag, and for people on Zoom, I'm pointing to the tags column with demo against some of those devices. This will be important in a second. Looking at one of the super spine nodes, we've connected the interfaces exactly as you'd expect. The first two interfaces are connected to the data center gateways, and then four other interfaces are connected down to the pods. We've given these IP addresses in the 10 slash eight range, just as slash 31. So we're building a layer three fabric here. So I'm gonna run through the demo, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by setting up the environment, installing Net Replica, deploying Netbox, and then running Net Replica against that uh, instance of Netbox to generate our container lab topology file. From there, we'll run our topology and build out our virtual network and use a small configuration script to push a configuration based on Netbox into those devices. Um, if I run through a bit quickly, uh, don't worry, there's a QR code at the end and I've uploaded this entire lab with very detailed um, instructions so you can run it yourself. It's all on GitHub, so there'll be a QR code at the end. So we're building a lab to test something, right? So we need a change to test. And anyone who was critical of my network design from five minutes ago would point out, eh, global OSPF across your whole data center is probably not the best idea. So what we'll do is we'll instead flip the pods over to use an individual instance of ISIS. So the IBGP within the pods will use an isolated instance to do the loopback reachability. And then we can remove the global OSPF and EBGP for everything else as it was. So we're only gonna change the pods here. Could we go ahead and play the demo video, please? So here we have our repo that we've cloned down, and we're gonna set up the environment. Everything here is Python, so we'll create a virtual environment that will install uh, a bunch of requirements. This is mostly for Net Replica and for the configuration script. We'll then go and activate the environment. And we'll install Net Replica. Uh, I've wrapped all these little steps up into nice, easy bash scripts. They're usually just one or two commands each anyway. As you can see, Net Replica is just a Python package. Uh, that's pulled down over Git. Next, we'll go and deploy Netbox. So this is a Docker Compose stack that will pull down our containers at, as well as some seed data for Netbox. I've done all the hard work, all the devices and network and connections are all documented already. So now Netbox is running with all its dependencies, Redis, Postgres, and the few other bits and pieces that it needs. So we can now go and uh, open Netbox, log in, Password's fairly predictable. And we'll have a look at our devices. So you can see here, we've got in the SID site, uh, very similar to what I showed previously. They've all got primary IP addresses assigned. They've got uh, the pod they're allocated to, the device type and the make and the model. You can also see we've got those demo tags there as well. Those demo tags are gonna tell NetReplica which devices we want to replicate in our lab. 
Here we've gone into the data center gateway and you can see that it's a 7750SR1S and it has the role data center gateway and the interfaces are all wired up exactly as we expect. Now we'll hop back into the terminal and we're going to run NRX or Net Replica. So this will connect to NetBox over its API and look for devices with the demo tag on them. It will then build a container lab topology file mapping the device type in NetBox to the virtual device that container lab can spin up. So here it's created this sid1.clab.yaml file and you can see a container lab topology file is just it's a simple yaml file. So we have all of our device types configured. The graphite container at the top is just a nice little web UI that you can show the container lab topology in. So you can see for our SROS instance, um, we've got uh, a 2310 image there for our SRL boxes, their correct model number, their IXR D3Ls, and we've got all the image and everything assigned. And down the bottom, these are all the links. So this is the exact topology as defined in NetBox. Data center gateway to super spines, to spines, to leaves. So now we'll go and deploy that lab. Um, I have sped this up here, but it still only takes two minutes. Um, C lab deploy, we'll then go and create all of our containers and all the links connecting our devices. Uh, you can optionally push base config as well when you create these instances, um, but we're gonna do that with our configuration management. So now we have our list of devices plus that graphite container. You can go and hit up the web UI for that and see what it looks like. Let's go and hop into one of our devices. We'll go into one of the DC gateways. So this is SROS. And we'll do a show version. And it indeed thinks it's a 2310 uh, version 7750SR. We'll check out the ports. And indeed, it's a 32 by 100 gig line card box. It's exactly what we documented in NetBox. The ports are down. Uh, nothing's configured. That's uh, exactly what we expect. And hopping into the global config, we've got some base configuration here, but there's nothing to do with protocols or IPs or ports or anything. It's just basic management, netconf is enabled, SSH is enabled, obviously, because we logged, in it, logged into it via this. We'll go into one of the SR Linux nodes. So in this case, a spine. And you'll see much the same. So the show version shows that it's a 7220 IXR D3L. Same model as NetBox. And it's got its host name and it's also a 2310.1 version. If we show the interfaces, uh, it's a little bit more uh, descriptive. You can see that they're already configured up. Um, NetBox, uh, Container Lab will, will by default for SR Linux bring the interfaces up. We can check the LLDP neighbors and it can obviously see the other SR Linux boxes around it. And it's connected on the exact interfaces as documented in NetBox. You can also see an LLDP neighbor to the host because uh, the host gets connected on the management interface. Uh, we'll just quickly check the NetBox instance default. It's not there because we've not configured it. So uh, let's push some configuration. Again, this is just a small shell script that calls um, a Python script that's included in the repo that will go and push our configuration for us. This Python script basically holds the place of what would be your configuration management. Uh, if you use Salt or Ansible or anything else, you can use that against this just like you would your production network. And so you can see we're producing diffs as we're pushing config to the devices. It's configuring interfaces with the IPs as per NetBox, OSPF, um, and uh, BGP within the pod, eBGP um, between the other layers. Okay, so configuration is deployed. I did speed this up. And now we should be able to hop in and just check to see what it's configured. So these are your standard diffs, just type in compare or show compare, whatever your NOS's version is, it'll, it'll show you the diff. So we'll go hop into the data center gateway and we'll see that, I'm assuming it's, oh yeah, our ports are up and configured. 
So we have the port configuration in there and we should have protocols working as well. So OSPF neighbors, we should have neighbors to the super spines configured and up and full. Uh, we should also have BGP neighbors established. We'll hop over, to, hop over to an SI Linux node. And look at the same thing. Slightly different way of looking at the same thing. This is just our two different NOSes. Um, so we'll go into the default uh, network instance and look at our protocol configuration. It's added OSPF to the interfaces that need it in Netbox. Because when you query the Netbox API, you can see the device that's on the other end of a link. And so if you know it's an interpod uh, interface, you can say, ah, oh, yeah, it needs this configuration. Or if it's going to a super spine, it can have this configuration. So we can see we have OSPF neighbors and BGP neighbors up. Note how there's four neighbors here, two to the super spines and two to the leaves. There's also four to the other leaves because we documented those in Netbox, but they didn't have a demo tag on them. So Container Lab didn't create them. However, because we're using the same configuration management tool that we would uh, otherwise, um, it's gone and create them anyway. So to test our change moving to ISIS, we're going to use Netbox tags. Netbox tags allows us to add some metadata to our devices. So we're taking the two leaves and the two pods from, uh, two spines from one pod, and we're adding this ISIS equals initial tag to those devices. The templates receives information from Netbox and looks at the tags. And based on the status of the tag, it'll push ISIS configuration to the box. But it won't remove OSPF because we want to try and do this as hitlessly as possible. So we've added those tags and we'll run the configuration management. Obviously, when you're doing this in a lab, you might want a lab copy of your production netbox so that you can be changing production devices in your lab instance and not affecting production. So here you can see we're getting diffs where ISIS configuration is being pushed to the spines and the leaves. The super spines and the data center gateways, there's no change. There's no, there's no diff there because we're only changing within the pod. We'll hop into our spine and we'll see that ISIS has been configured. Great. The network address has been dynamically generated based on the loopback, and again, the interfaces have the correct config. Uh, we'll show the adjacencies, and the adjacencies are all there. So this is a spine, so expect it to see the two leaf nodes. We'll have a look at the route table, and sure enough, we have ISIS and OSPF v2 IPv4 routes. Great. Currently, the OSPF route is the active, but that standby OSP, uh, ISIS route is there. Even though ISIS is the higher priority, it'll, on a protocol change, it'll swap. Now, our BGP neighbors have three, and three to four minutes uptime on this spine box. Keep an eye on that, because we'll reference that a bit later. Now what we'll do, now that we've got the protocol staged, we'll move the tags. So we'll swap from ISIS equals initial to ISIS equals final. What this will tell the templates is, okay, remove the OSPF configuration and just leave the ISIS configuration. So in Netbox, you can add and remove a tag in, in one call, which is very useful. So now those same four devices have the ISIS equals final tag. So we'll hop back over to our terminal and run our configuration script again. And once again, data center gateways and the super spines don't have any configuration changes, but we can see OSPF is being removed. Give this but a moment. And again, we'll hop into our spine node and see what it looks like. So we have no OSPF neighbors. Yeah, that, that tracks, that's what we expect. We still have our ISIS adjacencies and the transition time hasn't changed. No OSPF config, obviously. And if we go and check our BGP neighbors, we 
have five and six minutes uptime. So the uptime's increased. So we've managed to swap the IGP, which is used for loopback discovery, without affecting our overlay configuration within our pod. So there's been no service disruption for overlay networks inside the pod as we did this. Now we can go and check a, a leaf for exactly the same, make sure the BGP neighbors haven't changed state. And so now we have a successful change. We've managed to swap out the IGP, increase scalability of our data center network, and we've been able to do it on boxes that look and act exactly like our production network. The route table shows we've only got the ISIS routes, exactly what we expect. So I call this a successful change. Can we swap back to slides, please? So what we've managed to do today is to use our source of truth, which is Netbox, create a one-to-one -one replica. We didn't have to build a topology file ourselves. We didn't need to translate the IP addresses ourselves and reconfigure the base config in every single one of our lab devices. We've been able to use open source technologies to help us streamline this process and test a real world change in the lab exactly as if it would be done on production. It's the same network operating systems, it's the same configuration management, and we've been able to confirm that this change is successful, we can now go do it in production. As I said before, this lab is available on GitHub. Uh, please clone it down, there's detailed instructions. You can run through exactly what I've just showed you today and test it for yourself. Uh, Container Lab and its documentation are available at containerlab.dev. There's, there's links on the GitHub. Um, I implore you to check it out, it's a very cool piece of tech. Thank you so much. Has anyone got any questions? Uh, Dave Phelan from APNIC. Um, I've been using Container Labs for over a year now. Mm. Love it, great product. Um, and thanks to Nokia for devoting staff to keeping it running. So obviously it's built around containerized OSs. Mm. Um, there's a fork of a VRNet lab to allow you to use non-containerized routers. Correct. There is a glaring omission from the VR net lab fork, which mm. is Huawei. Right. A lot of this end of the world, there's a lot of Huawei. We can't emulate that. Okay. So we've put in, you know, I've put in issue tickets, I've raised it, and we just can't get any traction. Okay. I can look into that. I can look into that for you. Uh, maybe Drew might be able to help there as well. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Hi, I'm uh, Alin from Jonathan Wi-Fi. So pretty awesome demo. Thank you. Um, the dream section was pretty awesome as well. Uh, the way you usually get to a dream scenario is you find a use case that you can solve now, then grow the technology from there. So what are the primary use cases of a digital twin of your network do you see that are happening now and in the near future? So basically, uh, who needs CI/CD for network configuration right now? It's a, an excellent question. Uh, Yes, CI/CD for network configuration is a big one. Uh, what I want to look at next for you know future talks is network testing, where you make a change to your configuration management or your templates, you render those out, and in your pipeline, you spin up a digital twin. So you spin up a subset of the network. It could be two sites or three sites, or it could be you know a sub portion that of. You push the configuration onto it, and then you perform tests. So log into the device and check, are all my protocols in the state that I expect? Are the routes being passed from you know, A to B? You can check filtering, you can check firewall rules, you can test any of this stuff in the digital twin. Because this is not just a control plane equivalent, there's also data plane as well. So you could plug iPerf into one end and have a collector of running TCP dump at the other end to make sure that uh, yeah, protocol TCP 80 reaches across, but say TCP, I don't know, UDP 443 doesn't. Don't shoot me, Jeff. Um, you, can, you can run that testing the same because it is control plane and data plane. Uh, this, insofar as multi-user cases, it, it, engineers and teams can gain agility by all running separate labs. 
I can be testing something, you can be testing something, our colleague could be testing something else. Um, it also enables, you know, multi-vendor interoper interoper uh, interoperation testing. Uh, it enables uh, large policy changes. Say, for example, you want to test some traffic engineering. You could load up the network with a scaled version of that traffic engineering and then push in, say, SRTE rules. So load up all your links with two megabits of traffic and you know, see what happens when you change the path and preferences and costs. And then you can you know, check your links to see, oh yeah, this traffic moved from that link to that, that link, that's exactly what I wanted. The, the number of possible options are, are huge. And because these are containers, you can spin up any sort of container to connect into your container lab. It could be uh, a radius server for testing BNG functionality. It could be you know, 3GPP RAN type, to, uh, type technologies for, for testing you know, uh, that control end of things. There's many, many options. Thank you. Uh, I'm Raja, I'm from Cisco. I think you answered uh, my first question, the multi-vendor interoperability in now itself. I have a second question. Uh, every, in a multi-vendor scenario or in a single vendor scenario, you have the data path limitations, right? Every ASIC is different. Yeah. So how do you tackle that? Uh, I mean, how do you plan to tackle that? Yeah, that's uh, genuinely tricky because you can't emulate the silicon perfectly. This is not a perfect silicon level replica of the network. However, you can, for example, do all the way up to the control plane and basic data plane testing to ensure that the spec published by the protocols on your boxes will do what you want. So this will, in theory, shorten the time to do multi-vendor testing because anything that doesn't work at the protocol level, you don't have to build a lab to find that out first. You can test this on you know, the control plane and the, and the vendor OS in a virtual lab first before you commit to doing a hardware test. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, coming back to the first question, have sure. you tested with other vendors as well? Uh, uh, go to containerlab.dev. We list uh, a lot of different kinds. Um, there's many, many vendors that you can run in Container Lab. If the vendor publishes a, a virtual version of the NOS, we can probably make it work in Container Lab. Thanks, thanks. Great presentation. I have like sort of a philosophical question, if I can ask. Go for uh, it. Right now, the main use case that we can we have specified here sounds like automating creation of a network lab. So when does that automation turn towards not just a network lab automation to a real digital twin? What's the boundary between the two? When do you call your system a real network digital twin? Mm, that's a good that's a good thought. Um, if we look at some of the technologies coming into network virtualization now, you know, DBDK and some of this other acceleration technology, uh, I feel like there's a lot of work and thought that could be put into using that to build virtualized, true virtualized networks. And, you know, x86 performance with network forwarding has come a long way in the last sort of five years. So I don't see why we couldn't start moving towards for low scale, you know, sub 10 gig, sub you know, 100 gig, why we couldn't start using this type of tech to, to build networks like that. Um, think of it as, you know, a remote edge type network where you're just handling a few gigs of radio traffic or of, you know, low speed subscriber traffic. I think it's an interesting possibility and being able to dynamically change your network with, you know, containers and dynamic topologies could be a very, very powerful thing. I think it's a cool idea. Yeah. One discussion that's happening at IRTF uh, and, and ITF circle is like actual this definition mm. where I think we right now don't have a very clear consensus, but it's working. It's an interesting discussion on when we say like, even when we are saying that there is a replica of my physical network, at what dynamicity, at what timing, what are the basic characteristics mm. of a physical network as I emulate this in my lab. Yep. What is that relationship? In my mind, I think if we can nail those things down, that will define when your replica is actually a twin versus yes. just a lab. Yes, and that goes to the previous question. It's, it's how far down the stack without using actual ASIC hardware can we go to try and get something that 
acts in 99.999% of the time as the same. So yeah, it's, it's a great philosophical question. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Uh, are there any questions from the internet? No. All right, thanks, awesome. Tim. Thank you, everyone. Very insightful. We have one more speaker in the session, Cheng Li from CERNET, staying on the Brave New World theme. Can we make IPv6 a reality at last? This might be a good time to remind everyone that there's a V6-only network in this room. So you should use it. Good morning. Uh, I'm Xing Li from China, and we are running something called China Education Research Network. Slides, please. Okay, this is to topic. Can we make IPv6 only a rea reality now? And this is the outline of my talk. And basically, we have three networks running backbones. And actually, this year is the 30 years anniversary of China connected to global internet, as well as the 30 years anniversary of CERNET. And uh, okay, the first one we call CERNET, it's an IPv4 only network starting from 1994. And the second starting from, <coughs> oh, okay, because there are many, many students in China, it's about 320 million students. So we cannot get enough IPv4 address. So actually starting from 1997, we start six boom trials. And the later it turns into a IPv4 only CERNET 2 backbone. And the country actually were working something called CERNET 3. It is also IPv6 only. However, there are multiple slicing network. Actually, in total, there are 4K, 4096 auto, auto AS numbers and independently running. So that's something using SRV6, all those kind of things. So why CERNET is IPv4? but CERNET 2 and CERNET 3 are IPv6. The reason is we like IPv6 can solve lots of address problems. In addition, actually, if we run IPv6 only, not dual stack, then that can give us more benefits, eliminating complexity, operational cost, and uh, the thread vector associated with the operation to protocols, right? <clears throat> However, if we talk about IPv6 only network, the value of the network is to the square of the number of users. So actually this is the figure I borrowed from ICANN, CTO Allen. So that's the per head GPT and the per head IPv6 address. You can see developed countries both are very high. However, developing countries, especially the less developed countries. There are very few IPv6, so some kind of correlation. So even our network <coughs> be as IPv6 only, but still we need global connectivity for both V4 and V6. That's why we are doing something for, called the translation. I can give you a little bit history of what we are doing on transition. So back to the history, 1994, that's IPv4. And we realize we do not have enough address for V4, so we start IPv6 trials. And then later, actually, we try dual stack. However, we realize dual stack, actually, people just use V4, not use IPv6, because we got funding from government. So we build the IPv6-only network called CERNA2. And then, because IPv6 only backbone, then we can do something opposite. For six bone, actually, that's IPv6 over IPv4, but because CERNET 2 is IPv6 only backbone, we can do V4 over V6. That's why we get into the IETF and working the software working group. However, we realize no matter V4 over V6 or V6 over V4, four and six cannot communicate directly, so we try IPv4, IPv6 net. It's more difficult than IPv4, 4.4 net, but we can do it. And a, a little 
interesting name is my student gave this name called IVI because in Roman representation, IV means four, VI means six, so IVI means four and six can communicate. However, the problem is some application cannot support IPv6, for example, like Flash. Another thing is even the application support IPv6, however, the application layer embed the IPv4 address, for example, active F FTP, or if you think a web page, the URL is IPv4 address, not the DS, then you are in trouble. One way is you build ARG application layer gateways. However, for encrypt the traffic, you cannot do, do that. So we think if we can translation once, then how about twice? So we do double IVI, double translation. So anything can pass through. Net 4.4 can pass through this kind of double translation. Then later we realize, actually, if the IPv4 over IPv6 turn in is 4.2.6.2.4, and the double translation is 4.2.6.2.4, so actually we can unify the, the whole thing. So no matter it's encapsulation or double translation, that's the same thing. So unification, that's back to <coughs> software working group and that's the map T, map E. So the idea is translation is there are three things. One thing you have to remember, V4 and V6 are not compatible. So actually you cannot make your IPv source address V4 and the destination address V6. Whatever you need the both source address and the destination address in the same address family. So, and the, the translation actually means Okay, if you have a real V4 host and you want a real IPv6 host to communicate to that, actually the IPv6 host think the other side is also IPv6, but that's a mirror of a real IPv4 host. In the V4 world, the same thing. And the difficult part is in IPv6, actually you can find very easy to find address to represent even the global IPv4 internet because V4 internet global address is only 32 bits and in IPv6 it's 128. So a single subnet is like 64 bits. However, the trick is how to represent the V6 using very limited IPv4 address. And uh, actually it's quite easy. We can use a subset of the IPv6 address. So that's the idea and that's the RFCs. So either way is embedding and we have <coughs> the IPv6 prefix and you can embed V4 address whatever the place. And that's the RFC 62, 6052 you can check. And uh, okay, another thing act interesting is people actually like to use well-known prefix for IPv6. There is one. However, we recommend to use your own IPv6 prefix so you can make that globally reachable and each ISP can implement translation independently, do not rely on the other side. So that's the, the, the address relationships. And uh, in summary, in IETF, actually, you can see the whole translation technology, everything is RFC standardized. You can see if you run dual stack, then for IPv6, you can have like uh, every host have a public IPv6 address. However, because of the limited IPv4 address, you need to do that. So even, so you, you have some kind of state for translate, translation in dual stack. And uh, the ideal case is IPv6 only. So how to from dual stack to IPv6 only? You can have state for terminal in, which is called the DS Lite, very famous. Or you can do map E, that stateless terminal in, which actually is our team contributions with other partners. And also you can have the equivalent for map E, mapping address the port using encapsulation, mapping address and the port using translation, that's map T. And the equivalent part actually is six, 
464x late is also quite famous. And for stateless translation, v4, v6 is IVI or whatever stateless net64 and a very famous net64. So that's the thing. Remember, if you do double do stack or turn on you, you cannot reach single stack because if the other side is running v4, you need to keep running v4. However, for translation, the double translation can reduce to single translation and later that's the IPv6 only. So that's the idea for transition. And uh, however, the single translation or <coughs> IPv6 only does not contradict with the dual stack because there are two views. From network view, we have a translator called xlate. So inside our network is IPv6 only. However, the other side is still stack because v6 is directly communicated or routed. And for v4 actually is routed through a translator that's getting to another address family. Another view is operating system point of view. Actually, from the network's interface as IPv6 only. However, if 464, 464 xlate implement in the system. For example, actually Mac iOS and Android are both implement. So for your application that's still stack. However, the network interface is single stack IPv6 only. So that's the relationship. And uh, for CERNET actually we are moving in the dire direction of implement IPv6 only. Remember CERNET 2 is IPv6 only already. So we want to push further the campus network. So you can build a campus network IPv6 only. And in your border, you can have a translator. And for computers, actually, it's quite complicated. And for the Wi-Fi, actually, it's very easy because whatever the phones, you can have IPv6 only and 464 x integrate into the operating system. And for IDC, you can easily run IPv6 only server and through translator provide the services to v4 and v6. And the wired actually is the most complicated part. You can do double translation. So that's the, the server. And for server, actually, it's quite easy. You can just do one-to-one -one mapping and the DS4.6, not 6.4. So that's the way you can do authoritative configuration. And the server, the nice thing is IPv6, IPv6 single stack for firewalls, logs, whatever things. So all the logs, you can just deal with the IPv6 address and the IPv four is a subset of that. And that's the example we run in BOPT for videos and uh, because it's stateless translation, so the performance is quite good. And uh, for IPv6 only clients, I mentioned a little bit already, so you need a DS64 or double translation. So that's basically the same. And uh, because you need to share the public IPv4 address like NAT44, so you can do port mapping, whatever stateful or stateless. And the stateless actually map D, map E, we embed or encoding the port number into IPv6 address, so that's the same. And the good thing is for server actually you can control your DS for clients, a smart thing is the RFC 7050. Using DS, you can find a translator's IPv6 prefix. And uh, so, and the clients is quite complicated. DHCP v6, RA, DHCP v6, PD, or whatever thing. Uh, the good news is the Android support of 464 Accelerate, as mentioned earlier, double translation for Mac iOS is support. And for Windows system, actually, it's tough. However, the good news, Chrome recently in <coughs> integrated double translation into the browser, so you can use the cutting-edge Chrome to do 
double translation in Windows system without any problems. And uh, another thing, actually, we build, build the double translation for high-performance HPC VPNs, not the turtle in or whatever MPS SRV6. We just use double translation to do that. And for double translation to do VPN, the good thing is actually you do not need for ISP if you are doing internal in whatever the encapsulation method for the operation, you only see the internal endpoint address. However, double translation, if you have 1,000 end user, you have different 1,000 different IPv6 address, you can do whatever the traffic shaping or those kind of thing without decapulation. Currently, actually, CERNET and the China Telecom, we are working in IETF, actually. It's just adopted as the IDR working group. So if CERNET implement IPv6 only and the China Telecom implement IPv6 only in the border, maybe you need to do IPv4 BGP fine tunes because you were lost, IPv4 thing, everything. So one thing is you do translation from six to four, then do IPv4 BGP peering, and then on the other network translate to IPv only again. However, this draft is to do, we can use IP BGP extensions to embed IPv4 routing information into IPv6 as the attributes in control plane. You are interested, okay, two weeks later, that's Brisbane, we will have a presentation there. Okay, so for CERNET, the IPv6 only transition plan is the goal is IPv6 only in the year 2030 because that's the Chinese government requirements. And we need smooth and transparent transition and add values to the campus networks for IPv6 and the two slicing, double translation, single translation. So the idea is try to move the IPv4 address, embed into IPv6 and use that. So that's the basic idea and do things smoothly. And so what's in the future IPv6 in only in internet? My understanding is IPv4 will last for many, many years, maybe a couple of decades. However, probably IPv6 is the subset of your own IPv6 prefix. You can use that and still keep the identity, all those kind of things. So we can participate in APNIC and still continue discuss IPv4 policies for a very long time. So in summary, IPv6 is the future. The IPv4 may exist for another couple of decades in the form of subset of IPv6 address. The translation technology can make the IPv6 only a reality, reality, reality now and acting now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Of course we have questions. Of course we have questions. Uh, Dave Phelan from AP Nick. Um, seeing as those CERNET have been through most of the different um, network types, dual stack uh, and different transition technologies, have you been recording any uh, NAT offload benefits and the differences between them? And if so, is it published anywhere? Okay, yeah, we have some records. So it but by, by the way, actually, we're writing a book. Currently, it's in Chinese to summarize all those kind of experiments. All right. No more questions in the room. Any questions from the internet? Nope. All right. Thank you very much. I look forward to your book summarizing your research. <laughs> And that concludes this session, a couple of minutes early. I'll be
be there at the after party Show up looking like a zombie It don't matter, nobody stop me I'll be there, just tell me where Gotta make a choice, do I sober up? Am I trying to keep it going to be continued Or am I trying to lose, can I keep holding up? I don't think I wanna leave at a tough week Gotta realize this is what I need Don't got the time to be counting sheep It's too late, I'm in too deep Don't wanna contemplate, overcomplicate this And I made my choice, wanna see what's going on I'll be there at the after party Show up looking like a zombie 